We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Luke 14, join me at verse 16, we'll be reading through verse 24. Then he told him, a man was giving a large banquet and invited many. At the time of the banquet, he sent out his slave to tell those who were invited, come, because everything is ready. But without exception, they all began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. I ask you to excuse me. And another said, I just got married. Therefore, I'm unable to come. So the slave came back and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, the master of the house told his slave, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, maimed, blind, and lame. Master, the safe sled, we, we've done this already. What you ordered has been done, and there's still room. Then the master told the slave, go out into the highways and lanes and make them come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will enjoy my banquet. Would you pray with me? Lord, we're mindful today of your greatness and your power and your generosity. You, as the omnipotent King of the universe, eternally existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, never having need or want, eternally satisfied in your own being, would create humans whom you knew would turn away, and you would send your son in the flesh to speak your message, and that message would get him killed, and that was your plan, because you planned to raise him from the dead and give us, your subjects, life, life eternal, because he would die for our sins, and in time to send your spirit who would awaken us and birth the church and give us fellowship that we enjoy today, 2,000 years later, here. And we understand there's more to come. There's a great banquet. And we pray that you would help us to be worthy subjects, to exemplify what it means to be guests, 
that God Almighty would host. Let us be found worthy. Let us be people who host like you do. Let us be concerned for the poor, the lame, the maimed, the blind, and everyone with a heartbeat. We ask this in your son's name, amen. Doris Kearns Goodwin, in her book, Team of Rivals, profiles President Lincoln and his ability to bring together factions in his own party to assemble a cabinet of individuals who were more skilled politically than he was, more experienced, more well-known. And she gives, in some ways, a biography, though not a full biography. She's more concerned with Lincoln's ability to bring folks together in, in her book, but the biography lends itself to understanding Lincoln's life. Even in his early years as an attorney, a, a lawyer, uh, riding the circuit in Illinois, Lincoln was known for an ability to tell a story. He could spin a yarn, they said, and he could tell a story. Sometimes his stories would buy him time in making a decision. Sometimes his stories would indict someone. Sometimes his stories would endear someone. Sometimes his stories would fix a chasm between his position and his opponent. Sometimes it would build a bridge. And so Jesus' parables we're in the midst of a series here in chapel, and faculty are, are choosing a parable, and I'm just delighted to be able to think with you here about Luke 14. Let me give a couple of words just about parables and then about Luke. When we think about parables, a number of ways to interpret parables have been offered over the, the history of, of the church, from wildly allegorical to a very strict one message sort of interpretation. And it seems that in the last hundred years or so, there's a moderating of, of opinions in parables. And I would suggest that the parables of Jesus are an allegory that should be interpreted contextually in the nearest context of that pericope, that chapter, that book, and then canonically out from there, but inside out. And to think of the parables as offering strands of application for our lives. Uh, perhaps there's one primary thrust a parable would have, but there are implications for theology, for ethics, for ecclesiology, eschatology, and we'll see some of those even today. A contextually bound oracle, not paying too much attention to the details or saying just the messages in the characters, because both characters and setting matter, but not too strict or too loose, trying to follow their themes from there in the context. And maybe a thought or two about Luke would be helpful. Uh, along the way this morning, I'll make a couple of uh, suggestions for preaching for pastoral leadership as well. I preached through Luke in 2017 and 2018. Before I preached through Luke, I preached through Jeremiah, and I did that on purpose. I wanted the congregation to hear what Jeremiah said about Jerusalem so that when they heard Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, they would have a context for it in the prophetic strand. I would suggest that you try to do that with books, alternate old and new. You might preach through Deuteronomy and then Matthew. You might do a series in Psalms and then Hebrews. You might do a, a, a series in Isaiah and then Romans. I mentioned Jeremiah and Luke. You could do Jeremiah and then First and Second Corinthians and note how Paul quotes Jeremiah 9, 23, 24 in First Corinthians 1 and in Second Corinthians 10. He's bookending his correspondence with the Corinthians in light of Jeremiah 9 and the warning about boasting. You can make these connections and it will enrich the congregation. 
When we think about Luke, the setting unfolds here that we are looking at in chapter 14 in the midst of the travel journey. Luke 9, 51 to 1944, we have Jesus on his way to Jerusalem and parables are throughout. There are 16 unique parables in Luke and many of these are here in this travel journey. In fact, here in chapter 14 where we're at begins a series of parables and these parables, though parables are a casting along alongside. They're, they're a casting alongside of an allegory to make perhaps several points and bring ideas together. Here, the density of parables are not just casting alongside. They are part of the fabric of Luke's narrative. In fact, it's these parables that propel the divide between Jesus and his opponents. I would argue it's these parables that get Jesus crucified. They're a casting alongside, and they are a part of the fabric. Jesus telling stories over and over, just like Lincoln did, to make a point, to endear some, to castigate others. And ultimately, this is God's plan to get Jesus to the cross. Luke shares nine parables with Matthew 16 on his own, and many of the parables should be understood in light of the flow of Luke and Jesus in Luke 4 in Nazareth when he takes the scroll and opens to Isaiah 61, and he says, now this is fulfilled. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor recovery of sight to the blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And these parables unpack Jesus' role as God's final anointed prophet. So the parable before us, the parable of the great banquet. I want to use this parable to answer the question today, what characterizes the guests at God's great banquet. What characterizes the guests? Along the way, we will see that the the guests at God's great banquet are characterized by humility. That's the single idea we'll be thinking about today. What characterizes the guests at God's great banquet is humility. And that humility will be unpacked in two ways. First, in who the guests are and how they behave. So it's who they are and what they do. That shows humility. Humility isn't ambiguous in the parable or in the context. It's almost as if it can be checked off in some ways. And second, it's in how these guests are viewed. How they're viewed from the outside. So humility, who and what we do, and how we're viewed. And I want to do this by looking first at the parable itself and then unpacking it in its context. What I want to notice with you in verses 16 through 24 is that here, the parable Jesus provides us demonstrates a theological lesson in God's generosity. Notice again just the the flow of the parable. A man is giving a large banquet and he invites many. This parable, though unique here in Luke, has a parallel in Matthew 22, the parable of the wedding feast. This parable here preceding the triumphal entry, that parable following it, and it's likely the case that Jesus told the same kinds of stories in different contexts with different nuances and details, and and that's the case here. Here we just have a man, verse 16, who's giving this large banquet, and he invites many. And in the ancient world, to do a large banquet, it's going to take days of preparation, accumulating food, getting the preparations made, and there's a, an initial summons likely that goes out to invited guests. Hey, the banquet is in preparation mode. Know that in a few days, it's going to be ready. Adjust your schedule. Think about when this is going to be done, and there'll be a summons immediately. 
And, and the, the progress of the parable is, is in haste. Notice just the language of the text in verses 16 and following. There are few conjunctions and lots of verbs, and speed is in the details. This man giving a large banquet invites many, and now the pace picks up. Verse 17, at the time of the banquet, he sent his slave, come, everything is now ready. But they make excuses, one after another. A field, oxen, and marriage. Here we are, uh, February 8, and we have ourselves at National International Septuagint Day. Today, the International Council Study for... Septuagint and cognate literature recognizes today as International Septuagint Day, the day that we should remember to study our Old Testament in Greek, though Hebrew as well. And we think about the use of the Old Testament even here, just beneath the surface. What does this sound like? It sounds like Deuteronomy 20, doesn't it? Sounds like Deuteronomy 20, the exceptions for those going out to war. Deuteronomy 20, the first paragraph begins, when you go out to war, the priest is going to go forward and he's going to encourage you and he's going to remind you the Lord is going for you, ahead of you to fight your battles. And if it's the case that you just got married or you have these other exceptions, you don't have to fight. Craig Blomberg notes the idea this way. Jesus promises exclusion from the kingdom for those who initially say they will come to the banquet, but then make hopelessly lame excuses for thy, why they will not participate. A contrast with Deuteronomy 25 to 8 may be in view. Legitimate reasons for not serving in ancient Israel's army are no excuse for not joining the Lord's spiritually festive gatherings. But God's kingdom hall, his eschatological banquet hall, will not be empty. And that's what we see here. So, the slave comes back and tells the master, they won't come. And in anger, verse 21, the master says, then go out and get the poor the maimed, the blind, the lame. Verse 21. This slave was ahead of his master's wish. This slave knows his master's heart. This slave knows that the fundamental goal of the master is many people enjoying his bounty. That's the theological point. My master wants many people to enjoy his bounty. My master wants his house full. My master wants many people to know how kind and generous he is. And because of that, this slave's ahead of the game. He's already gone and found the poor, the maim, the lame, the blind. He's already gone and found the society's outcasts. Because in my master's view, that doesn't matter. In my master's view, what matters is a full table. Because it's not their condition, it's his character that matters. I know my master. What really matters for him is his greatness and his kindness, not the condition of the guests, not in society's view and not in their abilities. What really matters is that people know him. So I've already got them. And the place is still not full. This slave knows that his master is concerned for a full house, but the master makes it clear that he's concerned 
for quality as well as quantity. The quality of the guests is humility. Notice how the parable ends. Go to the highways, the lanes, and make them come in, so my house will be filled. For I tell you, and here's the idea of quality, not one of those men who were invited, and we understand in the context, invited and rejected the invitation when it came. They won't come in. Those who were invited and snubbed the great, generous banquet host, they won't be here. So what characterizes guests at God's great banquet? And I suggest humility is the answer. Have you ever been to an event where someone just had to have the last word? Have you ever been the person who just had to have the last word? Somebody's just chattery, can't just, you know. Maybe you've been in that situation, you're just hoping this meeting would end, and someone has to... And maybe it's a various kinds of meetings, could be a church gathering, other, and you just, oh my, here we go. Notice verse 15. This whole parable is because someone had to have the last word. I think some of the guests here are doing a face plant. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, The one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God is blessed. This statement from someone who just doesn't know when to be quiet inclines the parable. And this statement invites us to see the allegory in its context. So join me at verse 1. One Sabbath, when he went to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees, they were watching him closely. There in front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. In response, Jesus asked the law experts and the Pharisees, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? They kept silent. He took the man healed him, and sent him away. And to them he said, Which of you, whose son or ox falls into a well, will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? To this they could find no answer. He told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they would choose the best places for themselves. When you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, don't recline at the best place because a more distinguished person than you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come and say to you, Give your place to this man. And in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and recline in the lowest place. So that the one who invited you will come and say to you, Friend, 
move up higher. You'll then be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And the one who humbles himself will be exalted. He also said to the one who invited him, When you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, your rich neighbors. They might invite you back and you'd be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite those who are poor, maimed, lame, or blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, The one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God is blessed. Do you see how the parable should be interpreted? We begin in verse 1, one Sabbath. Here we have the first of a few elements of controversy. I call this the controversy quad in the Gospels. A specific place, a specific time, an audience, and an issue. That specific place is often in Luke a Pharisee's house. Sometimes it's the synagogue, later it will be the temple, and it's pretty much in that order in Luke's flow. A specific place, and here it's a Pharisee's house. A specific time, and that time is very regularly the Sabbath. If you want to follow Luke's flow of thought, just do a search on Sabbath and unpack the context. A specific audience, Jesus and his opponents, but often others who are looking on various crowds, sometimes the disciples, sometimes outsiders, but they're looking on an audience and finally an issue, very likely an issue of purity or the law. The more elements you have in a particular controversy setting, the higher the degree of controversy. If you have two of these elements, it's a mild controversy. If you have four, it's a major controversy. That's a place where Luke is bringing several themes together. It's a place to pay attention. Verse 1, one Sabbath at the house of a leading Pharisee, and notice they're watching him closely. Why? Verse 2, There in front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. He had dropsy. It's a disease of the execratory system. Your body doesn't emit fluid, and so you swell. And along the way, there are other systems that are affected, including the the respiratory system, the cardiac system. Uh, Multiple systems are involved, as well as your nervous system. It's painful. It's a swelling This man is in pain, and by many thoughts of Jewish tradition at this point, he's unclean. Wherever he would sit would be unclean, and he's at a Pharisee's house on the Sabbath. Are you doing the math with me? The Pharisees are willing to compromise their own purity laws for the sake of catching Jesus. It's a setup. Here's a guest who's useful. Here's a pawn. Here's a man who's suffering, and he's an object in their ruse. And Jesus knows it. Verse 3. 
Jesus asks, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Verse 4 is beautifully economic and full of compassion in three phrases. It can't be stated any more economically than this. Jesus takes the man, heals him, sends him away. What we have is a stark contrast between these hosts and their willingness to use someone for their own ends. And Jesus, the great liberator, takes him, heals him, sends him away. You get out of here. They've shamed you. And I'm honoring you. Already we have an inversion of who the real host is, don't we? (laughs) They think they're the host. Who's the host? Which of you, Jesus asks, as a son or an ox falls into a well, and you pull it out on the Sabbath day, You would do that for your son or your animal, and you're using this man who's already suffering enough. Jesus then turns to the guests and to the host in in that order. And in verses 7 through 11, Jesus sounds like a wise old uncle here, wanting to just encourage the guests in, in etiquette. This is just the rule. When you're invited by someone, you almost sense Jesus sort of under his breath. Man, come on, man. When you're invited by someone to a guest, don't go sit there. He's looking out for them. His heart is, you don't want to be embarrassed publicly by having the guest or the the host come and say to you, go down there. How embarrassing. No, I don't want that for you. Take the lowest place. When you're invited, go to the lowest place. So that you'll be addressed, verse 10, as a friend. Move up higher. And then in verse 11, he gets to the exact statement that is no parable. But the parables unpack it allegorically. Here's the point of the whole chapter. Verse 11. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And the one who humbles himself will be exalted. It's the reversal. And this is what Jesus has been proclaiming since he took that scroll in Nazareth in chapter 4. This is what God has been proclaiming since Isaiah 61. This beckons us to Isaiah 25 and the great banquet that God will host for all the people's And then turning to the host. When you give a lunch or a dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. They could invite you back and you'll be repaid. On the contrary, when you host a banquet, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. I've tried to argue this morning in looking at this parable and understanding it to be an allegory that needs to be interpreted in its near context to its canonical context that the point is humility because of God's generosity. God is so generous that he would invite us and he would invite the humble. I stated at our outset that the idea of humility here, I think, can be unpacked in even some objective ways in in who the guests are and in what we do, but also in how we're viewed So those would be the two columns that we would unpack. The second one, how we're viewed, we have absolutely no control over that. We have no control over how we're viewed. I hope that sets some of you free just in terms of a principle. Stop worrying about it. (laughs) Stop worrying about what people think of you. And start thinking about God's generosity. We can... 
take responsibility for what we do as guests of the great host. So I want to set out a few ideas for you here. Three. Three characteristics, uh, maybe we should say attitudes and actions that I think could be uh, unpacked as humility, a checklist almost. Not that humility would be understood as formulaic. It's one of those qualities that as soon as it becomes formulaic, you don't have it. But for a general list of instructions, let me list three ideas. First, an attitude. Number one, the humble are those who know their need. The humble are those who know their need. They don't have a claim or a right to sit at this banquet. There's a sense in which hopefully all of us have this healthy sense of Christianity in which when we understand God's grace and goodness and we gather in a place like this, even participating in general seminary life, general church life, we recognize it is amazing that I am here. Like, how am I here? How is it that I know God? There's a sense of need. As soon as we think ourselves a part of the establishment or that we are insiders, we are in a dangerous place. This is a word of warning for all of us in leadership. As soon as we think we are the center of it, take a step back. This kingdom was going on before us. It will go on after I am not the center of anything. I'm just happy to be here. Number two, number one is need, know our need. Number two is heed, heed the message. In the parable and in its context, in the parable, what makes the master angry is that he is rebuffed when his servant is sent out summoning those who'd been invited. They didn't heed the message. And in the context, Jesus is the messenger. And he is telling the guests, humble themselves. And he's telling the host, humble yourself. Go get the maim, lame, poor, and blind. Be more concerned about the resurrection of the righteous and reward then than your reputation in the here and the now. We heed this word. We know our need and we heed the word to continue to humble ourselves, to stay in a needy posture. Some of us just regularly need to hear that and and we just need to continue to, to remember that we are needy and we need to heed the word so we stay in that posture. How preventative is this word for us of a thousand proud sins. Heed the word. Tenderness to Jesus' teaching. And third, seek. Seek the needy. Know our need. Heed the word so we remember our need and seek the needy. Third, seek the needy. We can't get away from Jesus' priority of the the poor, the lame, the maim, the blind. How easy it is to gather around ourselves and in our patterns of life people just like us. People who are convenient. (laughs) People who won't inconvenience me. But brothers and sisters, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not about a convenient life. It is not about just gathering with your Christian friends and your Christian neighbors and your Christian identity and your Christian atmosphere. I just need to be around people like me. That's helpful. It's healthy. But it doesn't make any sense of 1 Peter 4, does it? Offer hospitality without complaining. 
It's pretty tough to complain about people you like. Go find people who are inconvenient, needy children, homeless. Find the needy. 